One thing I've always loved about Paleo Media is how experimental it can be. I've covered some weird dinosaur related topics here on my channel that came from the minds of people that would take them in some of the strangest directions I've ever seen. And I feel like I've only reached the tip of the iceberg when it comes to covering some of these works. But I can always appreciate when someone wants to do something different when it comes to dinosaurs, and there have been a few different footnotes in the history of dinosaurs in pop culture that has given many creative minds the opportunity to express these experimental ideas involving dinosaurs. And one of these points in time was in 1993 for very obvious reasons. It was during this point in time when dinosaurs were put back into the mainstream and with the spotlight on them, you can already guess there were tons of projects being produced that involved them to jump at this hype. This has led to several different strange but amazing stories, some of which utilize elements you'd see in traditional stories with that of the prehistoric fauna of the Mesozoic. And this is where today's video comes in. Age of Reptiles is a 1993 comic made by Ricardo Delgado, a director, artist, author, and comic book creator who's known for his film and show contributions for things like Men in Black, How to Train Your Dragon, Disney's Dinosaur, Avatar The Last Airbender, Symbionic Titan, and so on. It would be published by the American comic publishing company known as Dark Horse Comics one of the largest comic book companies in the US known for publishing several comics and graphic novels based on popular IPs like Alien, Predator, Terminator, Indiana Jones, The Thing, and so on. Within the span of just a little over two decades, there have been four main stories under the Age of Reptiles title, with a couple of shorter ones as well, that features different dinosaurs dealing with different everyday problems and struggles that would be considered normal in the Mesozoic era. Things like failed hunts, territorial disputes, harsh migrations, death and loss, and of course survival. And all of this is shown, rather than told to us, through amazing, almost hyper detailed drawings by Delgado himself. With the colors done by James Sinclair and Jim Campbell. Seriously, what I love about Delgado's art style is that in a lot of these panels, he never lets a single spot on the canvas go undetailed. In most, if not all of these panels, so much is going on that you end up spending so much time looking at a single page trying to capture every single animal and environmental features that are surrounding the main dinosaurs of the story before you finally move on to the next page. It really gives the art a lot of life as there are so many different animals depicted doing their own thing alongside the main conflict or scenario scenario of the piece. And there's actually a reason for this. I use those animals to give scale to the, uh, to, to the, the dinosaurs as well, if that makes sense, right? Yeah, very much. So like, you know, there's little stingrays and stuff in the lagoons, uh, the turtles, the, and... all that stuff, it gives scale to the animal. It reminds you that those characters are anywhere between 20 and 50 feet long, right? With the lack of dialogue and even sound effects, the comic instead makes use of facial features and actions done by the dinosaurs to get across the kind of tone that's being set for each panel. This of course is done within limits as to not stray too far from the realistic and even documentary-esque feel it establishes. This more naturalistic tone becomes more and more apparent as the series continues, as Delgado anthropomorphizes the dinosaurs less and the color palette of the comic becomes less vibrant as we get to some of the later parts. And speaking of the parts, as I mentioned earlier, the entire series is made up of four total main stories. The first is called Tribal Warfare, which was published in 1993. The second is called The Hunt, published in 1997. The third is The Journey, published in 2009. And the final one goes by Ancient Egyptian, published in 2015. Tribal Warfare, The Journey, and Ancient Egyptian has a total of four issues within each story, while The Hunt has five. A little while after the final issue of the third entry to the series was published, that being The Journey, the first three stories were re-released together in a combined book called Age of Reptiles Omnibus Volume 1. Since Ancient Egyptian came out a little later after this compilation was made, it's separate from the rest. Along with that, Delgado would go on to create two more short stories with the Age of Reptiles name for Dark Horse's anthology-based series called Dark Horse Presents which features various stories made by different authors and comic creators with their own styles. The stories are called Baby Turtles and The Body and can be found in the third and fourth issues of the Dark Horse Presents series respectively. We'll go through these as well, but a little bit later. 
If you want to check this stuff out for yourself, all of it can be found digitally on the Google Play Store where you can buy and view the entire thing, which is what I recommend you do before watching the rest of this video. Because today, I want to go through these stories to show you guys the wondrous and vibrant yet dangerous and terrifying prehistoric world that Delgado created. And this video is a summarized version of the comics and should not be used as an alternative way to view the work itself. If you try to do that, I can guarantee you that you won't be getting the same viewing experience as you'd get if you just buy the book and read it yourself. I'll link where you can find it in the description below. The version of the Age of Reptiles comic that I have is the Omnibus Volume 1 version. Without further ado, let's check out the Age of Reptiles comic. The first part of the first story begins with a pack of raptors, more specifically Deinonychus, hunting a small armored sauropod. They successfully kill the animal, which is shown in pretty brutal fashion, with the raptors slashing the sauropod's throat open and killing it, followed by them devouring the fallen animal. Despite the graphic nature of these panels, Age of Reptiles isn't just about the blood and gore aspect of the dinosaurs. While the action and behavior is definitely exaggerated to make for a more extreme story, especially in these earlier works, it does have its slower and realistic moments of a more natural tone to the dinosaurs, and you'll see that as we go along. Going back to our current story, the Deinonychus pack is soon confronted by a blue tyrannosaur, who chases them away from the sauropod carcass that it now claims. Games. One of the raptors attempts to fight off the tyrannosaur, but fails in doing so and being killed in the process. The rest of the pack retreats and the tyrannosaur feeds on their kill. The rest of the pack make their way back to their den, which is a large structure made of what could be elongated thorned branches or vegetation of some kind. The structure sits on a small clift island with a flowing river at the bottom that can be reached by crossing a hollowed log that serves as their bridge between the island and the mainland. We go back to the blue tyrannosaur who's had its fill from the sauropod carcass and makes its long journey back home, which seems to be a small open clearing protected by a rocky valley that can be accessed through a cave entrance. There, the blue tyrannosaur meets the two female adults from its pack, one of them sitting next to a clutch of eggs, which are his. The other female has one young tyrannosaur that chases a small mammalian animal, a proto-primate of some kind maybe. The two pair of tyrannosaurs fall asleep for the night, but are awakened to their eggs being stolen by a pair of Deinonychus that were a part of the pack that had hunted the sauropod the day prior. To get revenge on the blue tyrannosaur for stealing their kill, they steal his clutch of eggs and escape from the tyrannosaur is den with them. The blue tyrannosaur chases after them, but when they reach a gorge, the pair of raptors are able to jump across it with the blue's eggs. Unable to jump across the gorge himself, this part of the story ends with the blue tyrannosaur roaring in grief at the loss of his eggs. The second part of the first story continues with the introduction of a male green tyrannosaur that successfully hunts down a Parasaurolophus. Nearby are a trio of Deinonychus, which are a part of the same pack that had hunted the sauropod from the first part. The trio soon becomes a duo after one of the raptors makes the mistake of going too close to the water's edge of a river, as it's trying to eat what is no doubt some kind of Canadian fish crawling on land, and a large prehistoric crocodile, most likely a Dinosuchus, springs out of the water and drags its raptor prey back in with it. Stunned at first, the remaining two continue on their way and see the green tyrannosaur making its way towards a herd of beautifully colored ceratopsian dinosaurs. At first, it seems like a battle is going to ensue between one of the ceratopsians and the green tyrannosaur, but both of the dinosaurs end up retreating. The pair of raptors make their way back to their den only to find their pack being massacred by the blue tyrannosaur that had found out where they lived. The tyrannosaur then makes its escape by jumping over the ravine that separates the island from the rest of the mainland. The second part ends with the remaining raptors roaring in grief for their fallen pack members. And while we're watching the emotional impact this is having on the raptors, now is a good time to mention some of the slight anthropomorphism that Delgado has for the dinosaurs, primarily the Deinonychus in these earlier strips. Throughout this first story, a lot of the Deinonychus' emotions are shown through facial expressions, which give a cartoony, silly vibe to the animals. As I said earlier though, this kind of stuff is seen much less in the second half of the series, and we'll get into the reason here in a little bit. The third part of this story starts with more of the Deinonychus pack attempting to hunt down an ankylosaur but failing to do so unsurprisingly. We then go back to the green tyrannosaur who is actually a part of the tyrannosaur den from earlier and is the mate of the female with the 
the single T-Rex baby. The other female, who is the mate to the blue Tyrannosaur, is protecting the last surviving egg that the Deinonychus pack failed to grab when they had invaded the den earlier. Angry at the raptors, the female Tyrannosaurus track some of the pack down and find them near a beach scavenging for turtle eggs. The raptors make their way to a cliffed path up the rocky mountain, unknowingly trapping themselves between two female tyrannosaurs, who knock the three raptors off the cliff, sending one into the water, leading it to be devoured by a large ichthyosaur. The other two are kicked off onto the rocky shores of the beach, with only one surviving. The next panels show up the green male tyrannosaur hunting with his only offspring, but the young tyrannosaur sees a rogue Deinonychus and attempts to hunt it down himself. Unfortunately, this was a trap, and the single Deinonychus had led the young Rex to be ambushed by the rest of the pack. The green tyrannosaur follows the cries of his son, only to discover that he had been killed by the raptor pack. This part ends with the green tyrannosaur roaring in grief. The fourth and final part of this story starts with the raptor pack ready to devour a dying brachiosaur that had made its way to a sort of dinosaur graveyard, but as the pack attempts to indulge in their newly dead meal, another pack of other carnivorous dinosaurs made up of multiple species including Carnotaurus, Dilophosaurus, Oviraptor, and others, sees the dead brachiosaur for themselves. The Deinonychus pack retreats, with one of the pack members, a quilled Deinonychus, wanting to stay and fight off the invading pack but it's clear the Deinonychus leader feels it's better for their survival to retreat. This difference in what they should do results in a battle for dominance over the pack between the Quill Deinonychus and the leader. The initial leader is killed by the Quill Deinonychus, who is now the new leader of the pack. That doesn't last long though, because that evening he leads the pack back to their den, only to find the Tyrannosaur pack there waiting for them. The four adult Rexes storm the Raptor's Island den, and a battle between the two species ensues. The Tyrannosaurs kill and destroy the Raptors and their home, but the weight of all of the dinosaurs breaks down the cliffed island, sending all of them down the river and being buried under the rubble and debris of what used to be the Raptor's home. The following day, the only survivor of the battle was the Green male tyrannosaur. He makes his way back to his den, and the story ends with him finding the final egg, the one that one of the females had been protecting in the last part, being eaten by the proto-primate from earlier. And that was Tribal Warfare. It's an interesting look into what is essentially a turf war between two groups of dinosaurs that started off with a minor issue until one of the dinosaurs, that being the Tyrannosaur, drew first blood. From there, the situation would only escalate, leading to the outcome that we just saw. Hell, even the anthropomorphism can be seen in the plot, as this feels like a very human-driven situation. Of course, that's not to say that certain animals in real life do have their own back-and-forth conflicts with other species based on things like territory and food sources, but the dinosaurs in this story were definitely made to have malintentions and doing things for the sake of vengeance rather than instinct. I think the story does a pretty good job at balancing both of those elements, but it's clear that it was chosen to give off a more violent and extreme story, an element that Delgado would grow to dislike years later. Moving on to the next story, we have The Hunt, which is kind of, sort of, another dinosaur revenge story. It starts off with an allosaur young with its mother, living peacefully in some kind of desert environment, until they're attacked by a group of ceratosaurs. The mother allosaur takes on the four ceratos, leaving the young one to run away to safety. But the mother allosaur isn't able to defend her young for long, as the ceratos manage to take her down and eat her. The comic then shows a passage of time of about a year, and we go back to the young allosaur who is now a juvenile that is still being pursued by the ceratosaur pack. The allosaur manages to lose the ceratos in the desert, and they continue hunting for it until they reach a sauropod carcass. They begin devouring what left of the flesh, and the allosaur jumps out of the sauropod's hollowed body as it was hiding in there from the ceratosaur pack. The allosaur makes a run for it until it becomes weak from lack of sustenance. It passes out for a while and awakens to the cerato pack that managed to catch up with him. Also, what's really cool about these ceratosaurs is that they're able to camouflage, which you could probably already tell from their constant color changes in the different panels and how it matches up with their environment. Just as the ceratosaurs are about to attack the allosaur, the floor breaks apart under their weight and they all end up crashing through a large cavern, giving the allosaur a chance to continue running until he reaches an exit in the middle of the cliff with a flowing river at the bottom. The pack follow after him and they all fall out of the exit and down to the river, ending the first part of this story. 
The second part shows the Allosaur crashing down a waterfall but making it out uninjured. At the bottom of the falls is a massive lake inhabited by sauropods and stegosaurs. The Allosaur gets back to land and kills a Camptosaurus while the Cerrado pack make their way down the waterfall as well. They also make their way back to land and the part ends with them hunting and killing a nearby Stegosaurus, further showcasing their camouflaging abilities in the process. Finally, away from the Ceratosaur pack for now, the third part of the story starts off with the Allosaur resting near the lake. A storm breaks out, and the story shifts its focus from the Allosaur to a pair of pterosaur species fighting in the skies, high above the clouds that are causing the storm. It seems that the fight is due to territorial reasons, as the blue pterosaurs are very hostile towards the green one, as they bite it in mid-air, leading to it falling to its death. We then go back under the clouds where the rocky habitat of the green pterosaurs is struck by lightning, causing a fire, with the part ending with them witnessing the other green pterosaur from earlier falling through the clouds and down to the river to its death. The fourth part starts with a massive tidal wave emerging from the top of the waterfall and engulfing the entire lake area leaving behind very few survivors. Among the survivors, however, is the Allosaur and the Cerrado group. Seeing them distracted by the large pileup of newly dead sauropods floating in the middle of the flooded area, the Allosaur takes his opportunity to finally strike back at the Cerrados. He begins to swim under the island of dead dinosaurs and jumps out at one of the Cerrados standing on top of one of the sauropods, killing it and making its first successful stand against the pack that had been chasing him for so long. The fifth and final part shows the remaining three Cerrados attempting to hunt a pair of sauropods, until the Allosaur intervenes and fights them off. He manages to claw one of them to death, leaving two more to take care of. However, they use their camouflaging abilities, which work at first, confusing the Allosaur, but it manages to locate one of the Cerrados charging at him and rips its throat out. This leaves the final one, which finally decides to make a run from the Allosaur instead of chasing it. The Allosaur follows the retreating Cerrado inside a cave, where it catches up to it and throws it down from a cliff into plesiosaur-infested waters. The marine animals gang up on the last Ceratosaur and eat it alive. The story ends with an interesting little twist. The Allosaur realizes that the Ceratosaur that he just killed actually lived in that cave, and was a father and a mate, as he notices its family hiding from him in the cave. He notices the little baby Cerato that possesses the same color pattern as his father. What the adult male Ceratosaur had done to him when he was a baby, he had done to the baby Ceratosaurs here. And seeing how things ended up for the adult male Cerato, the Allosaur decides not to kill or chase after the offspring so it could avoid the same fate. The story ends with the Allosaur leaving the cave and moving on. The Hunt was a pretty good follow-up to Tribal Warfare, although the concept does feel pretty similar in the sense that they're both kind of sort of revenge stories. However, Tribal Warfare is more of a back and forth between two groups of dinosaurs with varying intentions for why they did the things that they did, and that in turn further escalated the situation, while this one was one continuous chase between ceratosaurs that were clearly antagonistic towards a single Allosaur for no real reason until the Allosaur finally decided to stand up for itself. Basically what I'm trying to say is that both of these stories have a rivalry aspect to them that feels similar to one another in certain parts. Despite this, I really liked both of these stories, but as I mentioned earlier, Delgado doesn't feel the same way. After The Hunt was released, Delgado wouldn't work on another Age of Reptiles comic book for 12 years, and in that time, his work as a media creator and artist had matured, leaving him wanting to create a more complex and realistic story when he would eventually return to the long dormant dinosaur comic. Enter the Journey, the third story of the Age of Reptiles comic anthology, that focuses on an entire herd of dinosaurs migrating in a desolate environment to thriving lands. Sure, it's not the most most original idea out there for a dinosaur story, but it does prove to be a comparatively much more grounded and realistic dinosaur story than Tribal Warfare and The Hunt. You see, these first two stories were very stylized and action-based with very contained and easy to digest situations of vengeance and back and forth battles between dinosaurs that feel as much like characters as they do animals. According to a 2009 interview with CBR News talking about the journey, Delgado
Delgado says, I really felt like the first two series were pretty naive in terms of where I was in my career and I had new stories to tell. I wanted to better express my growth as an artist and tell more complex stories. The first two series are just dinosaurs running around and fighting and all that. There's plenty of that in these four issues, but I wanted more of a complex and interesting story that kids and adults could read. The journey features the much larger scale struggles of the everyday life of migrating dinosaurs and the obstacles that they have to go through in order to survive. The story doesn't feel very linear because it doesn't just focus on one animal, but rather the entire herd and how these different dinosaurs are experiencing these different hardships simultaneously. The dinosaurs are depicted more realistically in how they behave and approach certain problems, there's not as much violence or action, as the focus is less about how dinosaurs interact with each other and more so how they interact with the world itself and the effects a long travel has on them. A concept that Delgado thought would be interesting to explore. The first part of the journey starts with a massive herd of dinosaurs waking up to a new day. This herd consists of sauropods, ankylosaurs, hadrosaurs, triceratops, ornithomimids of some kind, small pachycephalosaurs, and so on. They get themselves up and begin their long yearly winter migration towards a region with warmer climate conditions. They begin their trek across the desert, leaving behind weakened dinosaurs that are then scavenged by smaller nearby predators. Every now and again, the story will stray away from the focus of the herd itself and zero in on the short form individual situations some of the dinosaurs go through. For example, a baby triceratops notices some fruit near the tree line next to the path that the herd is following and goes after it. Immediately, it's mother knows the dangers that could emerge from the tree line and just as anyone suspected, a tyrannosaur crashes through the brush and goes after the baby. Luckily for the young triceratops, its mother intervenes long enough for it to get back to the safety of the herd. Instead of risking injury trying to fight each other, both the mother triceratops and the lone tyrannosaur retreat back to their respective places. We follow the tyrannosaur for a short bit and see that it too has young to take care of. The first part ends with the sun setting and the herd breaking up into their respective groups to settle down for the night after their first day of traveling. What I love especially about this scene is the clever way Delgado sees the sauropods sleeping, how they work and huddle together to give their tails and necks a place to rest on each other, along with doubling as a protective barrier for the young that sleep in the middle. In the next part, the dinosaurs continue their travels and venture through an almost dried out canyon with a small watering hole infested with prehistoric crocodiles attempting to bring down any prey that gets too close to the water. Despite the danger, some of the dinosaurs risk it on the account of being dehydrated from traveling through the hot desert. The danger doesn't stop there because at the end of the canyon is a hill of loose rocks leading down to the path they need to follow, and as the herd attempts to cross the pile, they slip on the loose rocks and fall down the hill. While most were able to make it past this obstacle, others weren't as lucky. And things only get worse when the herd attracts a huge pack of raptors that begin to successfully take down some of the dinosaurs. The attack would prove to be very brutal, but most of the herd was able to make it out and continue their journey. Time passes, days, possibly even weeks, and in all that time the dinosaurs begin to starve and grow weaker and weaker as more time passes. And yet, most of them persevere and trek on. Far behind the herd, the tyrannosaur follows with her young and scavenges some of the scraps that's left over from the carcasses of the previous hunt. The part ends with the herd and the tyrannosaur mother settling in for yet another night out in the desert. In the third part, the herd finally makes it to their destination, a heavily forested region with plenty of food, water, and of course dangers. While they're able to regain their energy by eating the nearby vegetation, the herd moves deeper into the woods where they encounter other predatory dinosaurs and crocodile infested rivers. But through it all, despite the inevitable casualties, the majority of the herd stand strong and continue their journey deeper into the new world. Well, most of them. The part ends with a baby sauropod stranded on top of a dead hadrosaur that starts to float down the river and out to sea. The final part of the story starts with the baby sauropod still on top of the hadrosaur corpse, which is being pushed towards a tall rocky formation being rested on by pteranodons and plesiosaurs, with a group of mosasaurs nearby as well. The corpse, along with the cries of the baby sauropods, attract the animals from the rock. The plesiosaurs and mosasaurs, along with other marine predators, start eating at the baby sauropods boat, but luckily, the waves had brought it close enough to land that it could swim the rest of the way, 
so the baby sauropod risks it and swims away from the corpse and surrounding group of marine animals. However, a mosasaur notices the baby swimming towards the shore and chases after it. Meanwhile, the rest of the herd have actually made it to the beach where all of this is taking place. And close by is the mother tyrannosaur with her two babies as well. The baby sauropod is able to make it on land near where the baby tyrannosaurs were, but also inadvertently brings in the mosasaur as well, which emerges from the water to try and grab its prey. But before it can do that, the mother tyrannosaur intervenes and starts one of the coolest fight sequences I've ever seen in a dinosaur story. The mother tyrannosaur legit starts battling the mosasaur and the fight actually feels very balanced in both animal size and location. It's also resulted in some of the coolest dinosaur art you will ever see in your life. Now I know I said earlier that the action based sequences are toned down to give room for more realistic and complex elements to the story, but even here Delgado approaches this battle in a much different way than his earlier works. While the early battles were brutal, graphic, and had a clear winner by the end of it, he decides to do something different with this one. Instead of giving one of these animals the win, Delgado instead takes the opportunity to show respect for both animals by not only making the fight fair, but also showing that both the Moza and the Rex are rulers of their own domains. In the end, I didn't want a victor because uh, my, my, uh, my, my statement was that it's the master of the land versus the master of the sea and you know no quarters given or taken but they all each each day's master of the respective uh, domains the story ends with the herd settling in for the night with the tyrannosaur family nearby all of the dinosaurs are at peace and they fall asleep as the sun sets on their temporary winter home and that was The Journey, and it's honestly a contrast to Delgado's earlier works in this series, and I do mean that in a good way. While I started this video off praising Age of Reptiles for being a project that had a good balance of exaggeration and realism, I've grown to love the changes that Delgado decided to make for the series to make it more complex and realistic. There would once again be a several year gap between the main stories from Age of Reptiles as the final issue of The Journey was released in July of 2010. The next part of the main series wouldn't be released until 2015, that being Ancient Egyptians. Of course, within the five year gap between the two series, there were two Age of Reptiles short stories that were released in the Dark Horse Presents comic, one in 2011 and the other in 2014. But we'll get to those stories later. Right now, I want to continue focusing on the main four stories, more specifically Ancient Egyptians. Ancient Egyptians takes certain elements from the earlier two stories, Tribal Warfare and The Hunt, and certain elements from The Journey. It focuses on a single quote-unquote character again, that being a Spinosaurus, but instead of putting it in a hyperbolized scenario for the sake of delivering a violent or action-based story, it instead focuses on the normal everyday struggles and day-to-day -day routine of the semi-aquatic dinosaur. I mean, I guess at this point it's no longer aquatic, <laughs> am I right guys? It's not constantly fighting or hunting, it's not always active or on the move, but it does have its aggressive moments where it stands its ground or does something extreme based on natural instinct. To put it quite simply, it's treated more like an animal. That being said, Delgado had some pretty interesting areas of inspiration when it came to the Spinosaurus that also characterized it a bit. As strange as it sounds, these forms of inspiration would be Japanese samurai films and American western films of all things. I'll go into more detail about this in its own section later in the video because Delgado actually has a lot of inspiration from different people and works, which in a way further emphasizes just how unique Age of Reptiles is. For now, let's get into Ancient Egyptian. We start the first part in the western deserts of Egypt, more specifically the Baharia Formation as Delgado mentions in one of the afterwards section of his book. Here we meet our main dinosaur, the one that we'll be following for the majority of this story, an adult male Spinosaurus aegypticus. It wanders through the desert, eventually reaching a forest where it continues its walking until it reaches a river. It submerges itself in the water and swims his way downstream, passing all sorts of prehistoric fauna. 
Crocodiles, turtles, fish, pterosaurs, and lizards reside in or by the river and for the most part mind their own business as this large crocodile-like dinosaur floats on by. As it continues its swim, a nearby theropod quickly emerges from the tree line, clearly being chased by something. It attempts to make its escape through the river, but its chasers, a herd of massive and very aggressive Paralititans, catch up to it and stomp it to death. The Spinosaurus, only feet away from the stomping, gets noticed by the large sauropods and it stands its ground in defense until the Paralititans decide that a fight is not worth their time. The herd returns to the forest and the Spinosaurus continues his swim. Night eventually falls and so the Spinosaurus gets out of the water to sleep on land. Meanwhile, a pack of Rugops scavenges the corpse of the stomped theropod dinosaur from earlier, which I think is a Deltadromius. The following day, the Spinosaur continues its venture down the river, feeding on various animals like stingrays, crabs, and large fish. That last kill ends up attracting a large, wide-mouthed crocodile called Stomatosuchus. So, quick tangent, because you're probably wondering where I'm getting all these names. Like I said earlier, there's an afterwards section in this book where Delgado goes a bit more in-depth with his creative process and inspiration for Age of Reptiles. And there is one specific section discussing where he wanted to base the setting of this story specifically, that being the Baharia Formation. I think out of all of the four main stories, this one had the most scientific research done for it to keep it as realistic as possible while still having that Age of Reptiles style to it. Anyways, in that section, he points out all of the creatures in the story that were discovered in the Baharia Formation, including the wide mouth crocodilian Estamenosuchus, which if you don't know is this lovely looking Permian animal. Later in his sketch section where he shows all of the rough drafts for his drawings, he correctly labels the crocodile but I thought it was kind of funny that a little error like this kind of just made it into the final product especially considering in that section. He literally mentions how he wanted to say a bunch of clever things but admittedly hated doing so. I guess now we know why. All jokes aside, it's clear that he's trying and I'm sure we could all appreciate him for that. Anyways, continuing with the story, the Stomatosuchus attempts to take the kill from the spine until it's kicked away. The Spino then sticks its head above the surface of the water only to be greeted by the herd of Paralititans from earlier. But they're only there to get to the other side of the river. This part ends with the Spinosaurus going back on land for the night. The second part starts with focusing on the Paralititans as the herd feast on the trees in a clearing while their young play nearby. However, what is also nearby are a pack of Cacarodontosaurs. They charge from the tree line and immediately go after the young Paralititans. Unfortunately for both the adult and the young Paralititans, the Cacarodontosaurus hunt was a success and they run away with their young. Nearby, the Spinosaurus emerges from the river with a fresh kill. It then spots a brightly colored female Spino that he grows attracted to. He approaches her, circles around her, and places his newly caught fish by her. She accepts his offer and the two become mates. When the two are done doing the deed, the male Spinosaurus makes a surprising discovery. The female Spinosaur already has a clutch of baby Spinos from a previous partner. So to ensure the priority of his own offspring, the male Spinosaurus kills and devours the baby Spinos in very brutal fashion, which is made clear by the red tint that encompasses the panel for most of the rest of this part. However, one Spinosaur young is able to get away from the carnage without the adult male noticing. Thinking that he's killed the last of them, the adult male finally rests, ending this part. Part 3 starts with one of the Cacarodontosaurs from earlier wandering around with a dead baby Paralititan in its jaws, who is trying to find the rest of its pack that had moved on from the area. It then runs into the herd of adult Paralititans who are still not very happy at what this Cacarodontosaur and the rest of its pack did in the previous part. Surrounded, the lone Cacarodontosaur attempts to attack one of the sauropods as a last ditch effort of defense, but is knocked to the ground. The rest of the herd then proceed to stomp the ever everlasting shit out of it, leaving behind a flat puddle of blood and guts. Right as the herd moves on, the male Spinosaurus shows up to the spot and picks up the dead baby Paralititan that belonged to the now dead Cacarodontosaurus. The male Spino takes the dead baby back to the female who ignores his offering. 
Night falls once again and we follow a pack of Rugops who spies on the sleeping herd of Paralatitans. Eventually, they're chased off by the bull Paralatitan. Close by, a pack of Kakardontosaurs are feeding on a dead Stomatosuchus, with the Kakardontosaur young wandering too far. The Rugops pack surround the young, ready to attack it, but are chased off once again as the adult Kakaros show up to save it. The Rugops continue wandering through the forest until lightning strikes nearby. When the Rugops reach the area that the lightning had struck, they find the charred remains of a lone Parala Titan. But they kind of just continue on their way until they find a good enough spot to sleep for the rest of the night. The next morning, a large pack of Parapasuchuses begin their day scavenging the area for easy meals, eventually stumbling upon the sleeping female Spino. I don't know why they think it's a good idea to approach the Spino nest, but they do anyways and instantly regret it when the male comes out and attacks them. The pack attempts to take the male down, but fail, resulting in several being killed and the rest being chased away. After the attack, the Parala Titan herd walks by the Spino nest. It's clear that there's tension between the male Spinosaur and the bull Parala Titan, but for now, they resist any confrontation and go about their day, ending this part. In the final part, time has passed and the Spino once again emerges from the river with the Stingray in its jaws. When it reaches land, it runs into the Parala Titan herd once again. Throughout the story, the Spinosaurus, for the most part, had kept its distance from the herd, only standing its ground and ready to attack when it needed to. And still, he had not disturbed or even really fought the herd. Despite this, it's clear that the Parala Titans have had a disdain towards theropods, especially those within their territory, as they are prepared to stomp and kill the Spino, even though he was just kind of minding his own business. The Spinosaurus is able to dodge the stomps and slashes the bull's stomach, instantly weakening it. This entire time that this conflict had been occurring, several other of the carnivorous dinosaurs that we have been following throughout this story have been witnessing the events go down. The Cacarodontosaurus, the Rugops, the Deltadromius, and the Aparapasuchuses. The moment they see the bull Parala Titan weakened, they make their move, with the Cacarodontosaurus pack taking the lead and pouncing on the weak sauropod. The rest of the carnivores make it to the killing and dogpile onto the bull, biting, cutting, and tearing flesh off of it as it desperately tries to get away. As it does, it trips, sending several of the once-latched carnivores flying into the air, causing even more chaos in this messy hunt. Despite the mess, it becomes successful. With the bull on the ground and its stomach ripped open, the carnivores begin to devour it alive. What results is a massive feast for all of the nearby meat eaters. Everyone except for the Spinosaurus, who never necessarily desired to kill the bull, but simply did so out of defense. And just like it did this entire story, it continued on its way, minding its own business and continuing its regular routine. But the story ends with the Spinosaurus going back to the nest, where he sees the female settled next to his clutch of freshly laid eggs. But this means that his work with the female had been done. She no longer needs him, and so the male Spinosaur leaves the area, the only witness to his departure being the surviving Spinosaurus baby from earlier. The male makes it out of the forest and wanders back into the desert where he had emerged from the beginning of the story. Between the release of The Journey and Ancient Egyptians, there were two eight-page Age of Reptile short stories made by Delgado. These stories continue to use the same elements as the previous stories, more specifically The Journey, as these stories had a more serious tone and grounded concept. Baby Turtles, the first one of these stories, was released in 2011 in the third issue of Dark Horse Presents, and focuses mainly on the short but deadly journey that Baby Turtles, presumably Baby Archelons, have to take from their eggs on the shore to their new life in the prehistoric oceans. Admittedly, the story is pretty simple and doesn't have much to it, but it's just an interesting and realistic view of life on the shores of the Mesozoic. The baby turtles are shown having to pass several deadly obstacles, mainly in the form of carnivorous prehistoric wildlife including pterosaurs, bird-like animals that may be Hesperornises or something of the like, and small mosasaurs of some kind maybe, I don't really know. The story ends with the turtles that survive this part of the journey going off to the depths of the ocean where they begin their new life out in the open seas. 
The next story would be released in 2014 in the fourth issue of Dark Horse Presents and is called The Body. Also an eight page story, The Body focuses on the decaying body of a Tenontosaurus. That sounds rather morbid, and it is, but it's more of a focus on the passage of time and the natural state of any deceased animals during this point in time. The story starts with the Tenontosaurus being taken down and killed by a group of Acrocanthosaurs. They spend hours, maybe even days, feeding on the corpse before before finally moving on, leaving behind scraps that scavengers like raptors and pterosaurs feed on. Soon the carcass has been picked clean and is nothing but bone, which then gets partially buried and fossilized as time goes on. Vegetation starts growing around it, showing that when old life dies, new life grows. Soon the bones are fully buried, leaving behind seemingly undisturbed ground, waiting to be discovered. Again, not much to these stories, and ones I'd recommend mainly to those that are completionists and maybe feel the need to have every single piece of Age of Reptiles comic at their disposal. As always, it has really great art, and there are a lot of things going on with the images themselves, but story-wise, I'd say they're pretty skippable. Ricardo Delgado is well versed with the world of film and animation. Not only is his profile filled with tons of admirable credentials and a solid history working in this industry, but he's also knowledgeable with and or fascinated by a lot of older works, many of which would help him in creating Age of Reptiles. Some of these older works include the paleo art of Charles R. Knight and Zdenek Burian. I don't think I'm pronouncing that correctly, but that's how the internet is telling me to pronounce it, so let's move on. Both of these guys were prominent figures when it came to dinosaur art from the early to mid 1900s. His more contemporary inspirations were people like William Stout, Doug Henderson, and Mark Hallett, who have all created some of the most well-known paleo art today. He gives heavy credit to these people for influencing him on the art that we see in his comics, especially in Age of Reptiles. It's also this reason he's pretty self-critical of his work and doesn't give himself a whole lot of credit when it comes to his art style. He literally starts the end section of Omnibus Volume 1 with, I'm writing these columns to go with my comic because I want kids to know and be exposed to my influences and to know that I am no one special and that I was inspired by people far more profound and influential than I could ever be. He then continues this in another paragraph talking about paleo artists, starting with, My only objective in these written pieces is to deliberately counterpoint anyone's misguided idea that I am in any way original that I'm anything other than an artisan crafting a story about creatures that I adored as a child and love as an adult. Actually, I can kind of relate to this. But as modest as I think he is, he does talk about some of the greats in dinosaur media in these columns. In this specific column, he mentions Ray Harryhausen, who was not only an inspiration for him, but also contributed to Age of Reptiles by writing an introduction for the Omnibus Volume 1 release. In this introduction, he talks about how he believes the world of film and stop motion was derivative of illustrations made for funny comics that were more common than any other genre in that format during that point in time. Soon the world of comics would expand and to other genres like dramas and science fiction and would even blend into the film industry as the detailed sketches were used to storyboard scenes and concepts that would immensely help filmmakers develop the envisioned scene for their movie. He caps it off by talking about just how Age of Reptiles takes him back to that point in time, when funnies were commonplace in comics and when he had to utilize stop motion animation to bring dinosaurs to life in his films. Whereas nowadays Delgado has found innovative ways from old methods to create dinosaurs with pen and paper that have had the same impact as his own works in film. Harryhausen's movies like The Seventh Voyage of Sinbad and The Valley of Gwangi awed a young Delgado, which is interesting considering he wasn't even much of a fan of westerns as a kid. However, this interest would eventually grow on him as he got older, and he would find this interest through another genre of film that was somewhat similar, and that was the genre of Japanese samurai films. He doesn't actually talk too much about his interest in these film genres until the release of Ancient Egyptians, as they apply more to that story than the previous three. The end segments of Ancient Egyptians also contain columns of essays that Delgado used to write about his inspirations for it. Out of all of his Age of Reptiles stories, Ancient Egyptians is his most mature one that emphasizes the kind of complex storytelling that he wanted to create with this series. 
And in that sense, it's really cool to see Age of Reptiles the way it is because to us, it is just a series of stories about dinosaurs in their everyday lives in the Mesozoic. But for Delgado, this is history of his progress as a comic book writer, as an artist, as a media creator. So in that sense, Ancient Egyptians could be that very threshold of complex storytelling that Delgado was trying to reach this entire time. Anyways, basically what I'm trying to say with all of this is that ancient Egyptians came from a place of deep meaning for Delgado. In the column, he explains that he wasn't all that interested in American Western movies as a kid because their portrayal of his race were often insulting. Latinos in these movies were often depicted as dirty, swarthy, amoral people or weak, subservient peasants. Of course, the only exception to this was the Valley of Guanji for very obvious reasons. However, during his college years, Delgado would discover a Japanese filmmaker that he became a fan of very quick, whose name was Akira Kurosawa. Delgado would indulge in many of Kurosawa's films, becoming a fan of his techniques and storytelling. After years of being a fan of his films, Delgado would be shocked to learn that a lot of Kurosawa's ideas were heavily influenced by American westerns. And after learning this, he would finally watch one, and one would become many as time went on. And despite the racial aspects of the films for their time, he managed to look past them and finally opened up to the genres of American westerns. And he would notice the many similarities they had with the Japanese samurai films that he grew to love so much. Although he makes it clear that the American westerns are not as good. But he still found an appreciation for them and their style, even saying some aspects for the color design of the Spinosaurus were actually inspired by the poncho that Clint Eastwood wears in Fistful of Dollars. And learning about these different stories made him eager to tell his own, in the form of a lone dinosaur in a desolate world full of dangers. And that's the point that he tries to make in this section, that, like most stories, his are a combination of elements based on old media expressed in new ways, and in that sense, his story is really multiple stories told as one. In one of the final sentences of this column, he says, As time went on, I yearned to tell my own stories, and this comparatively humble story Age of Reptiles, Ancient Egyptians, is about a samurai, a cowboy, a loner, who happens to be a 40 foot long predatory dinosaur. I guess my main point here is that a story is a story is a story, genres and categorizations be damned. There's so much more I can go on about Delgado's thought process and influences when it comes to Age of Reptiles, but I truly think you guys should just read this stuff yourself. For me, it's always interesting to read about the backstories of the creators whose work I cover for these videos, and I do it because that information is not always available in one spot for people. But seeing how Delgado has a whole section in his books where he just pours all of this information out to you, it's not only convenient for the reader, but it's just a treat to read about. And I continue to recommend that you guys just seek it out for yourself. So, what happened to Age of Reptiles? Did this series ever become bigger than a comic strip? Are there plans for any future installments to the series? Well, according to some sources, apparently Age of Reptiles was supposed to be loosely adapted into an animated TV show that focused on dinosaurs in the Mesozoic era with no narration of any kind. According to IMDB, the show was also supposed to be comedic and adult-oriented. But as many other sources also point out, the studio that was planning to create this show ended up changing the entire format to fit the style of a more conventional dinosaur documentary out of fear that straying too far from the norm would make the show perform badly. What was this dinosaur documentary you may be asking? Well apparently this planned Age of Reptiles TV show would turn into Dinosaur Revolution late in production, which explains the tonal shift the show has between comedic bits and more serious scenarios. Also Delgado actually worked on the show as well. I'm assuming he was initially brought in as some sort of consultant to ensure that the final product would somewhat fit the tone of his work. You know, back when it was supposed to be a loose adaptation of his comic. But after the change to the show, his role would change for it as well, because if you look at the end credits to the Dinosaur Revolution show, you'll see that he's credited as supervising director and one of the story artists for multiple episodes. It's sad to see that a TV show version of this comic was never created, with the closest thing to a TV adaptation being the Dinotasia spin-off from Dinosaur Revolution, which, from my understanding, holds a lot of similarities in terms of design and style to the main Dinosaur Revolution series, but has a lack of dialogue 
dialogue and narration to it. Other than that, the idea is pretty dormant. And speaking of dormant, so are the comics. The final issue of Ancient Egyptians was released in September of 2015, and to my knowledge, we haven't gotten anything relating to Age of Reptiles since then. But it's not like Ancient Egyptians really gave off any indications that the series was coming to a complete close. And the Mesozoic has such a vast timeline of events and dinosaurs, countless other stories could be told. And luckily for us, it seems that Delgado agrees with this. In that interview video, with Pastrami Nation, he ends it by saying this. I finished Ancient Egyptians officially the day before Comic-Con. I put that to bed and now uh, I'm getting ready to do the next series and um, there's still a few surprises left in the, Mes in the Mesozoic, let's put it that way. So who knows, maybe we'll get more Age of Reptiles sometime in the future, but seeing the inconsistent gaps between some of the works, it's hard to tell when we'll get that next part. In the same interview, when the idea of an Ice Age spinoff was brought up by the interviewer to Delgado, he didn't seem to hate the idea and even briefly mentions how he'd approach it. Regardless of what Delgado decides to do with the series, whether he wants to cover more Mesozoic stories or do stuff in the Cenozoic era, I'll be sure to cover it if or when he releases it. And should this be the last thing he ever does with the series, at least we can say we have an Age of Reptiles comic at all. Hello, if you made it this far into the video, thank you so much for watching and I hope you enjoyed it. But I want to take a few minutes right now to kind of let you guys know all that is happening this month because it's a, it's a pretty busy month. It's December after all, it's the Christmas season. Uh, initially this video was supposed to be kind of a filler video, it wasn't even supposed to be that long of a video, and uh, turns out I had more to say about it than I first thought, and it just ended up being this really massive thing. So yeah, <laughs> on top of that, I'm still trying to get one more video out this month. So yeah, it's, a, it's gonna be a pretty busy month. But on top of the content creation, uh, you know, there's other stuff that's happening. Uh, we have the 50k subscriber goal, which at the time that I'm recording this I haven't quite reached yet but we're so close to it that I'm pretty sure by the time I release this video we're basically there you know thank you if we're at 50k right now thank you guys so much I appreciate that and if we're not oh well that's fine I have a strong feeling we're gonna reach it before the end of this month so with that goal in mind it also brings into question when the 50k special is gonna be and with everything else that's happening this month and me trying to keep on schedule and trying not to delay other content. I may just wait to do the 50k special in January, basically next year, which I think is what I ended up doing for my 20k special, which I did earlier this year in January. And I think I reached that goal in December of 2021. So yeah, basically what I'm trying to say is it's, it's, it's slowly becoming a tradition that I reach my goals right before the end of the year and I always do the specials right after the end of the year. So we'll have something to look forward to for 2023. But in the meantime, I've got a couple other things planned. One thing I wanted to do is that uh, I wanna do kind of an end of the year slash 50K special live stream. And I am planning to do that sometime this month. The plan is to do it on the 17th, which is a week from this Saturday. But with just how weird my schedule can be, I don't know if that's gonna be the case. All I can say right now is just expect a live stream sometime during the weekend, sometime later this month. <laughs> I get it. It's the best I can give you right now. It's just going to be a very chill chatting kind of live stream. I don't see it being anything bigger than that. Uh, but yeah, that's just something that's going to happen this month. I just wanted to quickly shout that out. And I think that's pretty much all I have to say for now. Thank you guys so much for watching. Thank you for 50k subs. Thank you for everything. You guys are awesome. I will see you later. Have a nice day.